Howdy folks, this is Dan Gross and welcome to Extended Harmony for Outside In Music. Outside In Music is a record label and a media company that connects jazz artists with their passionate fan bases. Please visit us at our website, outsideinmusic.com, where you can see our artists and their recent releases, our podcasts, video interviews, and links to get in touch with us. Extended Harmony, what you're listening to right now, is a monthly podcast that features musicians in the jazz, soul, and blues umbrella who create original music we discuss their lives influences their creative processes and some advice they'd like to pass along as well joining us today is guitarist mike baguetta he's based in new york but he's originally from massachusetts and mike has an incredible ability to be instantly recognizable gripping intelligent and inventive all at the same time plus he's a great guy to boot which you'll hear in the interview we'll talk about his early life and influences how he approaches a leader versus being a sideman his guitar picking style his unique pedal set up future projects and of course like we said earlier any advice he'd like to pass along thanks for tuning in and please enjoy this episode of extended harmony mike thank you so much for joining us today yeah thanks for having me uh the first thing i well i want to say i've met you a couple times at bop shop records where i've recorded a couple concerts with you it was luke norris quartet a great saxophonist from eastman school of music and then another great saxophonist aaron Irwin trio so we've had a chance to interact a little bit and work with each other and there's this story that uh, I will tell later that Mamie knew that you would be a great interview guest. So we'll get to that. Uh-uh. Um, <laughs> you're not you're not in trouble, I promise. Uh, so let's just kind of start with your uh, superhero origin story. Where are you from originally, Mike? Uh, I'm originally from Agawam, Massachusetts, mm-hmm. which is just outside of uh, Springfield in the western part of the state. Mm-hmm. And how did you get started in music? Oh, geez. Um <laughs> Well, my my dad uh, is a guitarist. Hmm. Yeah, and and I think I've just always had like my earliest memories are him playing the guitar or seeing the guitar around the house. And uh, hmm. I started with other instruments in school, like you know third third grade or something. I I played violin for a little while and I played trombone for a little while. But I knew I liked you. I'm a trombone player too. <laughs> Oh, are you? Okay, yeah. Well, I, I didn't keep it up, so I don't know how much that counts for for me. Um, but the guitar always kind of was like this other thing. Like, you couldn't really do it in school up to that point. Um, right. You know, you had to do like a band thing. Uh, but I really I really just loved music always. Like, I always had a favorite song. I always had favorite bands. I always wanted to listen to stuff. I just loved how it was just kind of this different thing. You know, like it wasn't necessarily words it wasn't like a visual thing i don't know i just was really drawn to just the whole thing about music and so eventually i i think i kept bugging my dad to show me something and let me try playing his guitar and and yeah he was nice enough to to do that for me and um a lot of the first things i learned you know with chords he showed me or songs he showed me and then eventually we'd be able to play some things together and uh then i kind of ended up taking taking lessons with a few different people and going to college for, for, um, for music, Mm -hmm. um, doing guitar and and it's just kind of kept going. Where'd you go to school for music? Uh, I went to Rutgers Mm -hmm. in New Jersey. Yeah. And I studied with, um, there I studied with two great guitarists. Uh, the first one was named Ted Dunbar. Mm-hmm. And um, unfortunately, I, I think I was sort of one of his last students mm-hmm. as he had passed away while I was there. Mm-hmm. And then uh, another great guitar instructor there that I learned a, an awful lot from was named Vic Juris. Yeah, great. I've I've had the opportunity to play a couple of his albums at a Jazz ninety point one where I'm a I'm a DJ. Cool. Yeah, Vic's the man. <laughs> so what what got you into jazz? I mean, you were talking about your your dad having guitar and all the sort of the bugs you had in your ear about, you know, wanting to learn different songs or being entranced by music. Was there anything in particular that drew you to jazz? Yeah, but I don't, I don't think I knew what it was at Hmm. first. You know, um, my, my dad had, had a lot of different types of music around the house records and stuff like that. I think he had like some Jim Hall, but he also Mm. had a lot of Chad Atkins and then he had some big band stuff. And then there was like, you know, Neil Diamond and, mm-hmm. and whatever. So there was just like a lot of different types of stuff. Um, but I was exposed to like the idea of instrumental music 
like without lyrics, you know, through a lot of that stuff. So that was something that kind of intrigued me, you know, like, oh, there's no words on this. Um, but what really, I think what really, the point that I think I, I thought about, like, oh, I, I love jazz. Hmm. Um, like maybe that kind of describes something I want to do, sort of. Um, he had an album that, like, I, I, I like, um, wore it out. Um, <laughs> and it was this album by Jeff Beck, and the oh. album was called Wired. Yeah. And I, I listened to that album a ton. And one of my favorite tracks on that album, he does um, Goodbye Pork Pie Hat, the Charles Mingus tune. Right. And, you know, the great thing about like phys physical albums or even just like a thing that has sort of liner notes with it is that you mm. can kind of read something about the stuff. And I remember thinking like, well, this guy's name is Jeff Beck and the guy who wrote this song is named Charles Mingus. And then yeah. they sort of talked a little bit about it on the back cover, I think. So so I thought like, oh, maybe I should check this Charles Mingus guy out. Um, <laughs> right decision. And then, well, yeah, right. And it, yeah, really. And then from there, it was also kind of just that sort of liner note association thing like, mm. oh, they're talking about somebody named Eric Dolphy and they're talking yep. about, and then that's talking about John Coltrane and that's talking about Miles Davis. So in a way I kind of, I kind of worked a little bit, you know, backwards, I guess, if you wanted to think about it that way, chronologically, like kind of starting right. with Jeff Beck and, and checking out Mingus like really quickly and then getting into like Coltrane and then like 60s, 70s miles and then mm. kind of going, going back. You like start like late Coltrane too. I think the first like actual, record i got was uh impressions that coltrane record oh wow and then i got uh in a silent way mm -hmm. the miles thing and then i checked out some of the later stuff so you know eventually i kind of ended up working my way back and, and gaining a huge appreciation for a lot of things in the end what i what i love about the idea of jazz related stuff is the idea of improvisation and, mm -hmm. and the idea that you can tell some sort of musical story with with a personal voice um and i think today that that can get applied genreistically in mm -hmm. a limitless amount of ways but but i think you know it's it's still pretty honest to say that i i come from a jazz thing yeah and one thing i enjoy about doing this podcast is hearing the origin stories of all these musicians and I don't want to quite put a number on it, but some of them, you know, said, hey, I grew up in a jazz family. It was always around. And then others, a lot have actually done the sort of working backwards thing. So if this is a plea to bring back liner notes, I don't I don't know what is. I'm a liner <laughs> notes man myself. Uh, I want to fast forward a little bit. This is a this is um, an award or an accolade that I don't I've never seen on a bio before. So I want to pick your brain about it. I believe in your bio, uh, I mentioned an ASCAP Young Composer Award. Can you tell us about that? Oh yeah, sure. I don't know if they still do it or not. It was kind of a while ago, but they had a they had a little sort of I don't know, kind of like a contest or a little grant mm. thing you could apply for, and I think it was for musicians under thirty, maybe. Mm. Um, so it's the PRO uh, ASCAP puts puts it on, you know, the, like BMI and CSAC or the other ones. But so you would just sort of send in a composition mm -hmm. and i i think there was like a panel of judges or whatever and they kind of rate them um and they and this one time they selected a piece that i wrote so i was happy to uh to get that well there you go short and sweet yeah. I, I like the story yeah, it huh? was that easy yeah. <laughs> if only everything was so simple if only um so before we move on to uh the next little bit of questions i do want to tell this story so as i mentioned um i worked with Mike Baguetta, uh, doing a show with Luke Norris, who's a saxophonist who recently graduated from Eastman School of Music, and then with Aaron Irwin, another great saxophonist as well. So we talked a couple times, and we'll talk all about Mike's pedal board and iPad and, and all this stuff. But I, I was looking at it, and I'm like, wow, I really got to know how this works. So we started talking a little bit, and I'm asking how the iPad connects to everything. And he said, you know, most of the time it's, it's okay, the Bluetooth, there's not a lot of latency, but man, once in a while it does this glitch where it like plays a loop that I had played before but didn't want to, but no one notices because I play weird shit anyway. And that is when I knew <laughs> that I wanted to interview you. So thank you for that quote. That's a That was a great quote. Oh, sure thing. 
<laughs> um, I mean, it's. I should say that it's not entirely true. Um, for for the record, the idea <laughs> of like playing weird weird like yes, that's true. But um, I think it's also important to know that a lot of times, sort of more experimental music or the people that are that are playing it. Um, and I don't doubt that you think this, but just sort of so that it's on mm-hmm. the record. Yeah. Um, are very much in control of a lot of the extended techniques Absolutely. Uh, that are yeah. that are being used, whether it's sort of electronic processing or um, you know different different approaches to pulling sound out of the instrument. Yeah. So a lot of times when people people who aren't necessarily exposed to more experimental leaning types of things, you know, some of the attraction I think is visually seeing like, oh, what are they doing to that right. instrument, or how's it making that sound? And mm. that's that's a really great thing to get drawn into mm-hmm. into a performance. Um, but you know, it, it, it's also I think important to note that that you know these things get practiced um, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and, but and, but that is true. There is like a little glitch where sometimes it plays something back. <laughs> and so then at that point, my job is to think about as an improviser, right. how do I incorporate that thematically um, and artistically into what else is being played musically so that it doesn't come off like some weird, th- some weird, like sort of, um, 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 sort of uh, aberration that something went wrong. Yeah, right. Yeah. And the idea that there's some sort of unknown element being interjected into the music is really mm. exciting. Yeah. So in a way, like when you're improvising with someone, they might do something that's totally unexpected. And then you're sort of forced to change what you're doing and deal with it for the sake of the performance and the music. And in a way, sometimes this actually kind of acts as that same thing, which is exciting to me. Yeah. And uh, this is, we were talking, you know, as we're talking about this, I'm reminded of this classic Herbie Hancock and Miles Davis story where I'll keep it brief, but essentially Herbie's plan. This clip might even be on YouTube, but Herbie's playing along. So then Miles plays something, and then he responds, and you just like, "There's a note in there that is does not sound right." And Miles shoots him a look, but then he thinks about it, stops, and played something to make that note sound like it was in the appropriate context. That's a good lesson for any improviser that you have to hear what happened and instead of catastrophizing and making it like a mistake you just simply adapt oh yeah for sure and i think when you listen to a lot of a lot of music like that you really start to to hear how those things get formed and put together and it becomes really influential yeah uh moving on to the next thing because i did want to talk a uh, kind of a, a two-part question it's really having to do with your playing and your setup so you talked about sort of the the how the crazy visual draw for people who aren't associated with freer or more avant music is appealing. Um, so as someone who has is starting to gain appreciation for the avant side of things and seeing all the craziness, and I, I know your pedal board and your setup isn't the most insane thing ever, but it's a pretty big pedal board. You know, we, we talked about the iPad, which functions into the board through Bluetooth. It gives you EQ. It gives you playback. And while I don't necessarily want to go into each pedal and, and what each thing does specifically, I do want to ask about how you developed creating the pedal board that you did and the effects you did and what that allows you to do when you're improvising and working with other musicians. Yeah, I think what's important about that too is is sort of thinking about how does that influence how you work with other musicians? Because, mm. it, you know, it's easy to get caught up in like the ephemera of all the, of yeah. all the gadgets and stuff, but um, it is, you know, to the, to the, to the, the main end of making music. Um, and yeah, I don't think I really have that much stuff, but, um, and in fact, it's not even on a board anymore because it's easier to travel without one. So I just sort of sit on the floor and plug them in now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's basically there's basically just a couple of different sections like i have some sort of distortion mm-hmm. preamp kind of elements um so if uh, i have kind of like this fancy fuzz box made by um this guy paul trombetta out in northern california um and that gives me a wide range of distortion effects and sort of noise kind mm-hmm. of stuff and it's very controllable and it can go from very sort of subtle to very uh unsubtle yeah um and then i also kind of use this little preamp thing sometimes um or like a boost pedal by analog man and that basically functions as sort of like a little 
bit of a presence booster. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I'm using backline amps, if I have to, if I show up and there's like a twin reverb or something, um, this thing actually makes a lot of amps get into the sort of EQ zone that I really appreciate from, mm. from the sort of guitar amplifier connection. This has been a pretty recent discovery. The guitarist, um, friend of mine, Julian Lodge told me about it because we were talking about showing up and using whatever's there sometimes. So he had heard of this from somebody and recommended it. And I'm like thrilled that he did because it solved a lot of issues for me. Um, and then there's a volume pedal just to sort of get kind of levels right and be able to do sort of volume swell stuff. And then right. from there uh, is the first first kind of looping sampler thing that I use. Um, and basically at, at this point, like if I want to capture a short sample of something, kind of a, a glitchy sounding sort of sample or a textural sort of element and work with that, I can manipulate it in pitch or playback. Um, that's where that'll come in. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then after that, I think, I think there's just like a delay pedal. And then after that, I go into this unit called the H nine from the company Eventide, but it, it can do a bunch of stuff. All I really use it for is the, is the looper that's on that. Mm-hmm. And, and that is what is controlled over Bluetooth on the iPad. So right. the iPad is mounted up at hand height. So I don't have to keep bending over to, to tweak parameters and stuff, but it's just, it really just stays on the looper. I don't use it for anything else. And with that, I can get much longer, uh, much longer time, time loops up to, you know, I think it's up to like 40 seconds or something the way I have it set. Wow. And, and then you can manipulate the pitch and the speed and different elements of playback. Um, and you can sort of improvise with that in a, in a number of different ways too. And again, it's a thing that you kind of practice, you practice using it just like it's, part of the instrument another part of the instrument um and then there's like reverb and then it just goes to the amp right um so it's not really like crazy it's not like i have a ton of different sounds uh and a a lot of the ways i get different sounds is about how i'm playing the actual instrument too um that isn't necessarily reliant on on different effect pedals Um, yeah and, and i've been i've been kind of doing this sort of live processing thing I kind of really got into it when I started playing guitar. Like my dad had a couple of effects pedals around the house hmm. and I would mm-hmm. plug them in out in the garage and it would be way too loud and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and as I went on, you know, I kind of got exposed to a, a few different elements of this sort of live processing thing. Like I, I was way into King Crimson, mm-hmm. like later in my high school days. Um, there's some really early kind of Bill Frizzell stuff that was really influential. Mm-hmm. And then most, most importantly, for a lot of reasons, also in high school, um, my sister who I don't, I still, to this day, I've asked her, and I have no idea how she found out about this record, but she got me a record for my birthday or Christmas one year. And it was by the guitarist, David Torn. Uh, and it's called the album is called this means uh, what means solid traveler hmm. and that like that blew my mind because it was just all so much i mean you know he's a amazing composer and, and musician and just everything in so many ways but the way he was able to sort of deal with the live processing of guitar hmm. and incorporate it back into the overall aesthetic statement of the music that he's making is is really what became the most influential source of of that for me um, yeah of using that stuff and and so i kind of worked with it a bunch early on and then I sort of let it all go because I felt like I wasn't really playing the instrument as well as I wanted to. So I just sort of focused on just playing guitar and really not using a lot of effects for a while. And then once I once I mastered the instrument, uh, <laughs> just just kidding. Um, at a certain point, I realized like, well, you know, this is something I want to deal with. So why should I kind of prevent myself from using outside elements to make the music I want? And I got back into it pretty heavily, maybe, I don't know eight, nine, 10 years ago or something. And, yeah. and it's really been a part of my sound ever since, I I think. Yeah, and I want to circle back to a couple things. You sort of answered a few questions I had, and, and it was it was a rather obvious answer to what would have been an obvious question, but I wanted to ask it. I mean, the big thing about using effects like this is that you have to practice them. And however you do it, you just have to practice it. So that, that was one thing I wanted to cover. Um, yeah, and then sure. the, the two, there are kind of two parts to this, and you touched on both of them, is... 
The the first was a lot of the effect, a lot of the sounds you get and the style you get and, and what you're able to draw from the guitar might also be through the pedals, but and all the effects. But it's also how you play. You you have a, what I think is a very unique right hand technique, and you you play with a couple finger picks, which is not something that I I have seen in too many other jazz guitarists um and can you so can you tell us about uh how you develop playing with um the picks that you do and and some of the things that you do with your right and left hand that give you such a distinct sound um sure yeah uh, there's probably a couple things to say about that one is that i i actually don't really use finger picks um i just use my nails but occasionally i'll I'll break one sort of beyond repair or it'll get damaged beyond (laughs) repair. And so I was able to find a very specific type of finger pick that acts kind of as a replacement until the nail grows back and I can Mm. use it again. Uh, My middle finger, I have no edge in the nail kind of right where the string connects to it. So that one sort of takes a beating a little bit more than the others. So so when I need to, I throw this finger pick usually on the middle finger, although I've had to use it on the first finger too. Um, And it allows me to just continue playing finger style. Yeah, I stopped using a pick maybe probably also eight or nine years ago, although I'd used one pretty much the whole time up until then. Um, But again, I just wanted to I kind of wanted to just get into the instrument more. I wanted to kind of connect with it more, touch mm. the strings, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then also right hand wise, I use the whammy bar a lot mm-hmm. on the guitar. Maybe not so much for what people automatically think about that sort of like dive bombs and <laughs> animal sounds. Although there <laughs> there is a fair amount of that at times. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, it can, it really lends itself to sort of a very subtle appoggiatura kind of effect on Mm. the note, um, as well as, as well as just kind of getting some sort of pitch modulation that, that you are in complete control of the speed. And, uh, I also use it for a lot of sort of transposition, Hmm. um, of chords and notes. So it sort of ends up being like fake pedal steel guitar. Hmm. Uh, sort of stuff in a lot of ways and again that that and again another shout out to david torn who hmm. um, has really mastered that technique and pioneered that technique in a lot of ways and, and was generous enough to sort of answer a bunch of questions about about it for me um and so and so that has definitely been a thing that's interested me i've always actually i've always loved pedal steel guitar hmm. in a lot of ways to sort of fake elements of it on the guitar but um, the whammy bar thing has really opened up a whole bunch of sounds for me on that. And I don't really think of it as an extended technique. It's this thing that's on a lot of guitars and people just don't really deal with it in any kind of meaningful way by and large. Yeah. And, a, and there's a, ha- a handful of people for sure. Between being a leader and a sideman, how do you approach things musically? Because your sound is so unique. Do you, I mean, how, what do you, how do you approach a new project if you're a leader versus a sideman? Oh, um, musically? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, I think if I'm a leader, I just sort of try to try to do what's best for, for the idea of the music. And, and that isn't always like, that doesn't always mean like being in control of every aspect. Like, you know, I, I'm definitely not one to overcompose. I, I probably undercompose a lot, and mm-hmm. then I know that I, I can trust the people I'm going to play with to to bring their musicianship mm-hmm. and their musical choices to it. And that's why I'm I'm asking those people to play with me. Mm-hmm. Um, the only problem with that is that there's there's so many great musicians and so many people that I. I want to play with and that I know I, th- I fear that there will never be enough projects to, to do it all, but better than the um, alternative. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's that, but, and I think at that point, you know, it's just really about playing how I play. And I think to some extent that's also true for when someone asks me to play their music. Mm-hmm. I think, um, I think, and I hope that they're asking me to play their music because they hear, there's something that I do that that could lend a certain quality that they want in their music. Um, I think if you're asking someone to play their music because you need quote a guitarist unquote, I think that's probably the wrong reason to go about asking someone to deal with music in general, you know? Right. Um, 
But I mean, that's that lesson from Duke Ellington writing for mm-hmm. specific players that every that so many people have learned from so well. Yeah. Um, so I I already assume if someone's asking me to play with them, then they want to have what I do, which is kind of a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about today. Right. So I don't feel like I have to really not do a lot of the stuff I do because I feel like that's that's how I play. That's my sound to some extent. Um, but of course, you know, if they want to say, Hey, don't do so much of this on this one, do more of this on, on that piece. And, Oh, can you try to, you know, make this noisier or whatever? Like I'm obviously happy to, to accommodate what the music needs for sure. Right. So I don't know that there's too much difference, uh, musically, you know, besides, besides in one instance, I have to maybe give a little more direction, although I try to give as least as possible and then in the other situation i have to take more direction uh, which i'm more than happy to do yeah and uh let's kind of wrap up until the next uh the final part of our interview rather um we always like to talk about upcoming projects here in extended harmony and this one you wanted in particular to mention it it's not coming out for a while now i believe january 2019 was the date you gave me but it is not a it's not even a cd it is coming out as vinyl and digital download with mike watt and jim keltner can you tell us about that um yeah i can tell you about that yeah so right it's coming out in january 2019 and it's coming out on a a pretty new record label out of los angeles called big ego records Mm -hmm. um and it's shares a name with the studio where these um these sessions take place there's a really, uh, really talented musician, producer, um, recording engineer, and good friend of mine out there named Chris Schlarb, uh, who has a great band named Psychic Temple uh, that has records, <laughs> records out on band. Joyful Noise Records. Yeah, yeah, you should definitely check them out. Um, but he runs this studio, Big Ego, in Long Beach, outside of Los Angeles, and uh, and has started this record label where he releases sessions that he's he's put together at his studio so we were kind of talking for a long time about trying to do something together and i was just sort of joking around about like my dream band would involve mike watt you know who's the basis everybody knows from the the minutemen the Mm -hmm. seminal socal punk band and then the 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 stooges reunion band with iggy pop and etc and then uh, the drummer jim keltner who's basically recorded with everybody else you know he's on <laughs> well, he's on imagine by john lennon he's in buffalo springfield he did the the, the few albums with um frizzell he's done uh, a thing or two yeah right and, but what i really liked about both of those guys playing is that they they have these really deep grooves but it continues to evolve throughout the course of a piece it's not really just a static thing and and that's sort of an element that i really like in in music in general and that i i try to sort of maintain in my own music that there's something always kind of evolving um a- anyways make a long story short this idea ended up we ended up being able to make this a reality so um mm. So I went out there with a bunch of music and we were starting to record some of it. And as the session went on, I just sort of suggested maybe we maybe we try to do some improvised pieces. Mm. And it ended up working so well that we ended up doing hours of just improvised Whoa. pieces. Yeah. Um, and so I had a lot of stuff to go back and kind of edit from and sort of recompose to and um, mm. as well as a few actual pieces and there's sort of these tracks are also interspersed with some solo solo pieces um guitar electronic solo pieces as well so i <clears throat> so this album named wall of flowers on big ego records is myself with mike watt and jim keltner and that's coming out in january 2019 um and there, there's a lot more material that'll probably see the light of day uh, further on down the road. But I'm pretty excited for this music to get out. Yeah, well, we're excited, too. That sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, we got two more questions for you. The first one, do you have any advice for aspiring artists? Um, yeah, probably uh, the most important thing is to just keep believing in what you're doing if you really believe in what you're doing and it's different or people tell you it's too different or they don't understand it as long as you really believe it and you're really working on it like i think i really think that that's all you need mike thank you so much for your time man really appreciate it 
Yeah, thanks, Dan. Well, Mike and I called a little bit of an audible before this episode came out. Instead, we're going to listen to a track off his newest album as a leader, Spectre. This is the track, Passage.